Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and this is the first in another mini training series and we're talking all about integrated pest management if you didn't get that from the title. So let's dig in and get started. One of the things that we often strive for in our gardens is to avoid problems. Now, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that problems in the garden, just like taxes, are inevitable. They are going to happen and they are likely to happen every year. But problems come in many guises on the homestead, right? Pests, diseases, critters, although I guess critters could come under pests. Um, but prevention is better than a cure in the garden. And when it comes to avoiding diseases and some pests, it really starts with a healthy soil. And that's where we begin with integrated pest management is with the soil. A healthy soil is full of life. It's full of earthworms, different microorganisms, things like fungi, yeasts and bacteria. And they all work together to take things that were once living above the ground and they turn them into little packages of food that your plants can then use. And these diverse soils, they basically compete with disease causing microorganisms that are called pathogens. And they help to keep them in check because there's no room for these things to grow because there's all of these other helpful microorganisms that are already growing there. So let's talk about the basics to having a healthy soil and it's probably not going to come as a surprise what I'm going to tell you. Quit using pesticides, herbicides, chemical fertilizers, right? We want to be adding compost regularly to your garden beds. We want to be thinking about using cover crops and green manures and if you're already using them maybe see how you can use them a little bit more. We want to be rotating crops, right? We don't want to be growing that same plant family year after year in the same place. So for example, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers and eggplants, they are all in the nightshade family. You want to avoid growing them in the same place that had another member of the same family growing there. Like let's say that you had peppers growing in one bed last year and you've got potatoes that need to grow this year, right? You don't want to be putting your potatoes where you put your peppers, but you also don't want to be putting your potatoes in a space that had tomatoes growing the year before or peppers growing the year before or eggplant the year before. And it's not just for the nightshade family. I just chose that as an example, right? So do a little bit of research and find out what plant families you have and what you're going to be growing and see how you can work your crop rotation into your garden plan. I know I've talked a lot about garden planning in some of the previous episodes. Um, so check those out if you want to know more. Now, one of the other things that we can do when it comes to integrated pest management is to grow a variety of plants in your garden, right? We want to be growing lots of different crops, not a monocrop. And that's a really good strategy to have in an integrated pest management type of garden, right? This type of gardening is popular in not just, you know, organic gardening, but also permaculture and even farming, right? There's a lot more information that is coming out about this type of gardening. And really, when it comes to integrated pest management, you need to care for the care for the beneficial beings above and below the soil surface. And I'm going to be real with you for a minute because healthy soil doesn't happen overnight, I'm sorry to say. And I'm even sorry to tell you that it's not going to happen within a year or within one growing season either. It takes about three years for your garden to come into balance for both the soil and the natural pest management. So, I mean, if you think about it, the first year that you put in a garden is a really big change for your land, right? You've got different level of nutrients that are going to be available. The plants are going to be different from what was there before. You might have pests or diseases that were not there before that might visit. But keep at it. It will get better. And believe me, I know how this is going to be because, you know, this year, this is the first year on a brand new property. There's no garden here and I've got to put one in. And before it was weeds that were like five foot tall um there was lots of i think it was woad actually that was that was growing and grass there was an occasional like milkweed plant that was growing here and there and i'm fine with the milkweed for the butterflies and stuff but 
yeah there was there was a lot of weeds there and we cut them all back and since cutting them all back like all the critters like the the rodents and stuff they're like hey where's my home gone um so they have been looking for other homes but that's just an example right as i start to build the garden beds i start to add compost to the ground or i start to grow cover crops things that had not been growing in that area before we're going to see different changes for things and that's why it takes time for you know your garden to become established right and if this is your first year growing a garden i'm you know like i said i'm right there with you and one of the things that i'm going to be doing which i really recommend that you do too is to take lots of notes lots and lots of notes get yourself you know a fancy little journal and take notes about what it is that you've done to the land you know what did you add what did you change and you know write down things that you're seeing on the land it may seem like you know just random information but as you go back and you look through your notes you may start to see a pattern of something and you might be able to identify oh when I did this this happened and it worked or equally when I did this this didn't work and you know I don't know a crop failed or whatever happened but you might be able to correlate it back to something that you did earlier in the season and be able to really kind of capitalize on those successes and avoid you know the I, don't, I hate to use the word failure because it's not a fail you've you've learned something um but it's a really good tool to have and i also think it's really valuable to take lots of pictures of the garden so you can see how far you've come like i mean we were kind of pretty daunted about now the snow's melting like oh my gosh where are we gonna start with this garden and we've got to do it quick before all the weeds come back and you know we were kind of talking um before my husband um left for some training like how how did we want the garden to to look and you know i was kind of like going back through um my phone and you know realizing that 90 percent of my pictures are of the dogs um but eventually like i started seeing pictures of you know the house when we bought it and the the garden and it was like just full of all these weeds and i remember showing it to my husband was like hey hey do you remember when the garden looked like this and he was like oh my gosh yeah and then we started cutting it all down and i was like yeah now you know now you've seen what it was now you can take a look back and be able to say no we did a lot of work last year even though it was the end of the year so take lots of pictures so you can see how far you have come and how different your garden is growing and also how different your land starts to look so now you know that it's going to take some time to you know really get the garden of your dreams um let's start talking about some strategies to help right and i'm going to start with uh compost because to me that is the obvious starting point right compost is going to feed your soil it is going to add organic matter to it it is going to help improve um, moisture retention it is going to help improve your soil structure it is going to do a lot of stuff for you so if you are not already composting this might be a good time to listen in maybe grab a pen and paper and take some notes so composters you can build one you can build a separate compost container you can buy a ready-made one you can get ones that are tumbling ones that you lift off there's loads of different composters available for a myriad of different budgets and you can put it in a totally separate place in your garden but i really urge you to consider putting it in the garden right let's show off our compost heaps right there is nothing that does more work for the garden than a compost heap and i think we should be proud of our compost heaps and not hide them behind the garden shed or wherever people seem to to put them i don't know maybe it's just an england thing like i we I never saw like whenever I looked around you know fancy gardens and stuff like a compost bin was never somewhere where it would make sense right 
I like my compost bin to be in my garden so I'm not having to drag like wheelbarrows full of you know corn stalks or you know tomato plants that I've pulled up like I don't want to be dragging that clear over the other side of the garden to put into the compost bin no I want my compost bin there um so I definitely urge you to think about putting it into your garden and you know you've got less less walking to do carrying tons of stuff right um but I've actually just started reading a couple of books and they're talking about composting directly on a garden bed and they rotate the compost beds each year like you would rotate a crop I mean can you imagine how great hungry crops like corn or cabbages collards pumpkins squashes even potatoes can you imagine how good they're gonna be growing where your compost heap was the previous year that's a pretty exciting idea to me and one that may kind of set me apart from my family members in the annual pumpkin growing competition so hopefully my family are not listening to this because I might have just given away the secret strategies that I'm going to be working on um but I think that there's a lot more that we can do to be composting in our garden. And you might be thinking, ah, Emma, I don't, I don't have enough materials to compost. So I thought I would actually share with you what I compost and kind of how um, we collect those materials here on the homestead. I'm kind of a weird chick if you haven't figured that out already right and when it comes to composting I'm a little bit obsessed um I started composting the day that I moved in like here when we bought the house um when we were kind of in the pop-up trailer sort of driving across from from Utah I felt so bad every day that I had materials that could be composted that were going in the garbage. I felt so bad doing it. So I, I wanted to make up for it when we, you know, bought the house. And so I started composting day one. Like our stuff hadn't even arrived yet. Like we were sleeping on, you know, an inflatable <laughs> mattress on the floor and I was still composting. Yes, yes, I am that crazy gardener um but one of the things that we do is we collect things from you know the house for the compost bin and we collect them in a five gallon lidded bucket and before i tell you what goes into that bucket um i want to let you know that you need to be on top of taking that bucket out to the bigger compost bin and if you were using a tumbling composter, for example, then a five gallon bucket is going to be too big. And I can't tell you the number of times that we left the compost in, or the materials for the compost, let's say, in that five gallon bucket and then I had to try and put it into the tumbling composter and no matter how carefully I would kind of shake that stuff out of the composter oh out of the bucket into the composter oh my goodness no matter how many times I tried to do that I always ended up with stuff down my front all the way like over the composter on the floor and I would spend more time picking it up and putting it like into the composter and then having to you know put my clothes in the the washing machine and get a shower because I was covered in grossness um you know it was just so so not worth the time versus if I had collected it in something smaller to put into the bin that would have actually fit into that space on the tumbling composter but also just the two or three minutes that it would take to walk that bucket down out the garden and into the compost bin so the more that you take it out to your compost bin like it's not going to smell as much um but also if you leave it in the house it is going to start stinking so it's also a good idea to hose it out occasionally and give it a wash out with soap and water periodically now i have a um a shred bin of shredded newspaper and junk mail and that helps keep the smell down in the kitchen a bit so i'll put like a big handful of shredded paper um on top of like veggie peelings and offcuts from cooking dinner so if you've got anything that's like 
particularly like damp or wet you want to put that onto some shredded paper and then put some more shredded paper on top right because you're mixing things that are high in nitrogen and high in carbon right your pa shredded paper is high in carbon whereas your you know kitchen scraps are high in nitrogen so now I've shared that tip with you what goes in to the compost collection bin well, obviously, shredded paper and vegetable peelings and offcuts go in there for a start. But also coffee grinds and paper coffee filters, fruit peelings and cores like apple cores or pear cores, orange peelings, those kind of things, right? The standard stuff. Um, I also put in things like lettuce that has gone super slimy, mushroom stems or bits of soil in the bottom of mushroom containers and incidentally I use mushroom containers and um, salad boxes to start my seeds in. Um, so I always seem to have a lot of those and much to the annoyance of my husband I keep collecting them to start my seeds in. Although the joke's on him because he's going to come home from training in a few weeks time and the house is going to be a jungle. Uh <laughs> So uh, what else goes into my composter? Well, dog fur is a regular addition. I have three dogs, um, as is dust in the vo vacuum because I have three dogs, right? So I'm vacuuming quite a lot. Um, if my husband has been baking or making breakfast, then, you know, if he's got excess flour from making bread that's kind of on the counter, he'll scrape that into the compost bin. Um, crushed eggshells will also end up into the compost bin. So things like that tend to be in there we don't put things like meat in there we don't put um you know grains nuts seeds those kind of things into the composter it's just really strictly things that are bruised or damaged like you've dropped you know a tomato and it's gone bad or you know there's a bruised bit from your apple those kind of things that go in there um we don't have like a lot of sort of fresh um veggies that are going bad particularly we tend to go through things quite a lot but you know if you've got carrots that you're peeling and you know you're topping and tailing and stuff all of those all end up in the compost too but what about things from the garden well it depends on what we're doing in the garden so you know if i've been pruning stuff you know i'll run tree and shrub prunings through a wood chipper and put that into the composter um also grass clippings from an untreated lawn um leaves if it's fall right i gather up the leaves and put those in a in a composter um if material from cutting back comfrey or nettles or other plants that grow quickly um clary sage and tansy often made it into my compost heap in utah because i was cutting things back that grew quickly so i could get around the garden beds and clearing those paths um i don't tend to put weeds in there unless i have drowned them for a few weeks in water um just because i don't want them to basically start growing in the compost heap uh, other things that go in corn stalks sunflower stalks bean and plea bean and pea not plea bean and pea plants um that i have cut at the soil level so i try to keep the roots in the soil rather than pull things up with the roots and all i tend to just kind of cut things at soil level or a little a little higher so little stumps are left because those will eventually break down so the roots and things that are in the soil they're going to start to decompose and they're going to help your soil that's kind of how the green manures and stuff are working so um you don't have to pull things right out of the ground you can if you want um, but you don't necessarily have to. And I certainly didn't when I was in Utah. Um, and things things grew just, just fine when um, they were left in that bed to decompose. Uh, what else goes in there? All oh, things like um, lettuce that is bolted too early in the season. Um, tomato plants, if they do not have signs of disease. So if there are signs of disease on the plant, I'm not going to put them in the compost bin because I don't want to spread that disease around the garden so i'm pretty sure you get the idea right as much as you can you want to be adding things into that compost pile to then spread that compost on the soil back in the garden right because as we're harvesting things we're depleting that soil we're taking nutrients out and we want to be putting things back in 
Now, you don't want to underestimate permaculture chop, chop and drop mulch. Oh my goodness, I definitely need some more coffee this morning. Um, but don't underestimate chop and drop mulch tricks, right, to help improve your soil. Um, some plants like comfrey are really great for this. I used to chop my comfrey plant when it had started to flower and then I would just kind of leave it all around the base of the tomato plants. It worked pretty well. Um, and certain crops, definitely comfrey, um, but certain cover crops work very well to chop and drop. So things like winter rye, hairy vetch, crimson clover, buckwheat, oats, those things come to mind as being like really good things to chop and drop. Now, I will say that you've got to get comfortable in growing these types of crops because you're going to be cutting them down. And I really struggled with this. The first time that I grew cover crops, I had such a hard time like cutting them before they flowered or just as they flowered. And I felt so bad when the buckwheat was flowering because there was all of these bees and pollinators all over it just kind of you know feasting on the nectar and the flowers that were there and I cut it all down and it was so so hard to do and one of the things that I have found in using cover crops um, but also using companion planting is I now make sure that I have you know spaces in the garden that are full of flowers and other sources of you know, food for these plants. So I don't feel quite as bad now when I am cutting all of this buckwheat because I'll kind of sow some buckwheat um, in other places that I will just basically let flower. So in a, in a flower or a perennial area of the garden. So I don't feel too bad. And it's close enough to the vegetable garden where it is going to provide you know, habitat for some of these beneficial insects and things that we've talked about in some of the other episodes. So, you know, you need to get comfortable with using cover crops. And, you know, I think it's a change in your mindset too. And it's one that I had to do myself because when it comes to using a cover crop or a green manure, right, you're not necessarily looking for a harvest in the traditional sense of a harvest, right? Right it's best put to use in building the soil because it's going to provide more nutrients for the next crop going in and that's your harvest your harvest is when you cut it down and then let that you know sit on top of your soil or if you want to you know turn it over into your soil you can do that too but that's your harvest and it's it's not a harvest in a traditional sense you're harvesting its nutrients to then feed your next crop, whatever that may be. So this year is going to be kind of exciting for me because I'm growing a number of cover crops to cover the soil as winter comes and protect it from the snow. But I'm also going to be growing cover crops to improve drainage. So I've never grown um, forage um radishes before or tillage radishes or a daikon radish um, because those grow these massive roots that really penetrate deep into the soil and the really cool thing about certain cover crops is they can help improve soil structure by basically creating these channels where water can then move through now for those of you that are part of the facebook group you may have seen that there are some pictures of my backyard slash pond that <laughs> is now in place right in the area where I had planned to put my my garden and um you know you can you can check out the the post if if you want to um but one of the things that I kind of talk about in in this is there's some different strategies that that we have to you know make use of that space but one thing's very clear that if I want to use that space to do anything productive, right now it's like halfway up my shins in water. <laughs> um, but if I want to use that for growing, then I definitely need to do some stuff to improve that soil and improve the drainage. And one of those things that we can do that with is by using certain cover crops. So we're not just creating these you know, channels where water's gonna be able to go, also as, as the plant has died off it's 
providing an increase in organic matter so we're going to start to see more beneficial microorganisms and things in the soil we're going to start to see more earthworms moving in as the soil conditions become more favorable and as the soil structure starts to improve we're going to start to see better harvests happening right we're going to have healthier crops we're going to have healthy seeds we're going to have so much more coming from the soil than what we ever thought was possible and that's really where we're starting right we're starting at the very beginning and we're starting with how do we improve our soil and it really is as simple as adding some compost so i would love to hear from you what is it that you are doing in your garden first and what goes in your compost pile where where do you keep your compost in your garden in fact if you're part of the facebook group show me pictures of your compost pile i would love to see them and until next time i hope your garden grows beautifully and i will see you all next week <laughs>